Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexandra Green, and I'm the president of the Black Law Students Association at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, so just to give you guys a little bit about our speaker today, uh, Valerie B. Jarrett is a senior distinguished fellow at the University of Chicago Law School and is a senior advisor to the Obama Foundation and Attention. She serves as board chair of When We All Vote and co-chair of the United State of Women. She also serves on the boards of Lyft, Ralph Lauren, Walgreens, Boots Alliance, 2U, Sweet Green, Aerial Investments, The Innocence Project, Time's Up, the Economic Club of Chicago, and the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. Her New York Times bestselling memoir, Finding My Voice, was published in 2019 and updated in paperback in 2020. Ms. Jarrett was the longest serving senior advisor to President Barack Obama. She oversaw the offices of public engagement and intergovernmental affairs and chaired the White House Council on Women and Girls. Ms. Jarrett worked throughout her tenure at the White House to mobilize elected officials, businesses and community leaders and diverse groups of advocates. She led the Obama administration's efforts to expand and strengthen access to the middle class and boost American businesses and our economy. She championed the creation of a I'm sorry, of equality and opportunity for all Americans and economically and politically empowering women in the United States and around the world. She oversaw the administration's advocacy for workplace policies that empower working families, including equal pay, raising the minimum wage, paid leave, paid sick days, workplace flexibility, affordable childcare, and a culture free from sexual harassment. She also led the campaigns to reform our criminal justice system, end sexual assault, and reduce gun violence. Ms. Jarrett has a background in both the public and private sectors. She served as the chief executive officer of the Habitat Company in Chicago, chairman of the Chicago Transit Board, commissioner of planning and development, and deputy chief of staff for Chicago Mayor Richard M. Daley. She also served as the director of numerous corporate and non-for-profit boards, including chairman and chief executive officer of the Chicago Stock Exchange, chairman of the University of Chicago Medical Center Board of Trustees and director of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Jarrett practiced law for 10 years in both the private and public sectors and has received numerous awards and honorary degrees, including Times 100 Most Influential People, as well as the Abner J. Mikva Legal Legends Award. Ms. Jarrett received her BA from Stanford University in 1978 and her JD from the University of Michigan Law School in 1981. Everyone, please join me again in welcoming our speaker, Ms. Valerie Jarrett. Thank you, Catherine. What a great introduction. Hello, everybody. It's good to see you all. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Vatsala. I'm one of the co-presidents of ACS, and I have the great fortune of moderating this discussion today. Um, so we have some pre-prepared questions that I'm going to go through with Ms. Jarrett, but if you have questions as, they're, as they come to your mind, please feel free to send them in the chat either to me or to everyone and we'll, we'll answer them as they come up. Um, and we'll also leave some time at the end for a Q&A if you want to raise your hand, your blue hand, um, and ask a question yourself. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Sounds good. All right, so our first question, um, this, this summer, you know, policing has been on everyone's minds and the protests this past summer against police violence um, have been hailed as the largest and longest in American history. Uh, do you think that this particular moment can or will create real change with regards to police reform? Well, it certainly can. And I think we'll still wait, we're, we'll wait and see if it does. There has already been some change uh, in ordinances that primarily cities have passed on no-knock warrants and chokeholds, but I think we need far broader reforms than just that. And I'll back up to a bit just to say, because of my age, I'm old enough to say that in my lifetime, I've never seen anything like the record number of protests. All 50 states, people of all ages, all backgrounds, all races, uh, saying that Black Lives Matter. And, um, and that's a good thing. And most of those protests were peaceful and it just irritates me to know when, when the press focuses on like the one building that's burning and it's the same building that loops over and over again. And it gives the impression that that was what was going on everywhere and that's simply not the case. Um, I remember during the 60s, the protests that we had that were primarily in Washington or in the South, cities like my hometown of Chicago, but they weren't ubiquitous the way they were this summer and I think Look, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, too many more to name, but who should be honored. Um, it was like an unbelievable wake up call, but you have to ask yourself, why did it take their deaths to wake up? Why didn't we wake up when Eric Garner here in New York 
had police um, on his neck until he died and cried out in the same way. Why didn't um, people react when Laquan McDonald in Chicago was shot 16 times in the back or Michael Brown that really was the beginning of the creation of Black Lives Matter in Ferguson, St. Louis. I mean, why was it something that happened this time? And I think it's a combination of factors that form this perfect storm, the COVID-19 and people being stressed out and in their homes for months on end and feeling frustrated, looking at the health disparities between people of color and the rest of the um, society and why something is like the tipping point, it's just unclear to me. But the question is, what do we do about it? And how do we make sure? I know we want to talk about police in the Black community, but I look at police as a microcosm of society. Those police officers who um, engage in discriminatory, outrageous behavior, they were raised by parents in communities with neighbors who probably have the same feelings about Black people that they have. And so the good news is, though, is I think the business community gets that. And I'm on a whole bunch of boards and there isn't a board meeting that I've been on. There isn't a business organization that I've been a part of that hasn't said to itself over the last several months, what can we do? And I say, get your own house in order. Stop pointing at the police department. Yeah, they need to correct. And there are some very clear ways in which they could correct their behavior. But what are we doing as a society to end systemic racism? And let's start by admitting it's there. Um, so the question you asked is, is this a moment, an inflection point, or is it a movement? And I hope it's a movement. And I take heart, not just in the protests this summer, but in the fact that a record number of people turned out in the election that we had a couple of weeks ago. More people voted than ever before in our history. And that's a good sign because 100 million eligible voters did not vote in the last presidential election. And so I've always felt we have to couple our voices using our First Amendment rights, using our freedom of expression and association to say, yes, you have to get on camera. You've got to show that there is um, you know, a groundswell of people and then the visual helps. But you also have to show up at the ballot box and vote. And um, the fact that that has happened around the country is a good sign, but we have to keep the momentum up and that has to come from you. And I say you, I should say us, the American people. That, and it's hard, it gets cold, it's getting ready to get, it's already getting cold in Chicago. People don't feel like going out and protesting in the cold, uh, but we have to keep that momentum up and put pressure on our local government leaders because that's really where the police departments are regulated. And then now that we have a new president coming in in January, encourage him, which he will be absolutely willing to do to ensure that his Justice Department returns to the practices that President Obama put in place where we look for patterns and practice of discriminatory behavior, held cities accountable, required them to enter into consent decrees. Uh, and that's one way of making progress, not to mention providing resources to implement the 21st Century Task Force Report. I mean, there's a lot that the new Justice Department can do that we have begun and that lay dormant or went backwards over the last um, four years. So long way of saying I'm hopeful, but I also know that you know people get tired and they say, oh, all right, well, President Biden, Kamala Harris, they'll go fix this. No, no, they need you to help them fix it. And so we have to keep that activism going regardless of who's in the White House. Long well, uh, answer, sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, and that's actually a perfect segue to my next question, um, which is about Chicago's federal consent decree, which has been in place for uh, nearly two years now. Um, and it doesn't seem like we've seen a lot of real change. Uh, the Guardian published an article in September about how Chicago is the only major city to not com commit to police reforms in light of the George Floyd protests. Uh, we saw the use of force working groups, recommendations largely would be rejected by CPD. Um, so I'm wondering why you think Chicago police in particular is seems so reluctant to reform. Well, it's interesting. Mayor Lightfoot, um, I spoke to her right after there was a call to action by President Obama for all of the nation's mayors to do an analysis of use of force. Um, and she committed to doing that. And I assume that that is ongoing. Uh, whether there has been radical change yet, you would be a better judge because you're in Chicago and right now I'm in New York. Um, but it does take time and it shouldn't, but part of what you have to do is change the culture. And that gets back to my earlier point that these folks who are in law enforcement come from communities. And part of what we have to do, I believe, 
um, and we can have the conversation about dismantling police versus reforming um, if you would like to go there. But I, what, one of the things I think are, is easy to do that we called for in our 21st Century Task Force report is take a look at the, at the current state of play, engage with your residents. What are you doing to recruit officers and what are you looking at in their background that makes you think that they're qualified, have the temperament, the strength, the self-control necessary to meet what should be very high standards for people who we give a gun and a badge and who take an oath to you know, serve and protect. So what are you doing in recruitment? What are you doing in training? There should be, and this is a national issue, a national background um, check so that we don't end up in situations like we did with Tamara Rice in Cleveland, where Tamara was shot and killed like instantly by a cop who arrived on the scene at age 11. Um, and that cop had been fired from a suburb of Cleveland previously, but yet the people in Cleveland did not have that data. Well, come on, you guys, that's ridiculous. Of course, they should have a national background inventory. So before you hire somebody, you can see where they were before. Um, teaching and training implicit or explicit bias, teaching and training de-escalation. Our military are trained to escalate. Our police should be trained to de-escalate. What are we doing to get them outside of their cars? What are we doing to hire people who come from the neighborhood, who have a trust already from their, from their um, community residents and who are more likely to be able to establish the kind of social contract that you need in order for law enforcement to be effective? If the people in the community don't trust you, they're not gonna tell you who's breaking the law because they're not gonna trust you to meet it out fairly. And so you need that bond of trust. So there's just like a treasure trove of things that we could be doing, um, including, and the ones I mentioned all require more money, but police do a lot of things that they shouldn't be doing. And that includes in Chicago. I mean, they are the first line of offense. If somebody is having some sort of a psychiatric crisis, the police, we call 911. They aren't trained for that. They should have a social worker with them. They should have somebody who's able to help in a way that doesn't involve handcuffs, it involves assistance. And we've cut a lot of our funding for mental health in this country going back decades. And so, so many people are on the street who um, it's not that they're poor, it's that they have a mental health condition and they need treatment. They don't need law enforcement. So I say all this to say, what is Chicago really that different? I don't know. I think if you were, I think part of the problem is that that consent decree was negotiated right at the end of our time. And once we left the um, attorneys general, whether it was Sessions or Barr, had no interest in enforcing the consent decrees. And the consent decree requires the party in power, which is the federal government, to demand accountability. And that hasn't happened. And frankly, I think that would help the mayor would, if the um, Justice Department were to say, where are we? These were the steps that you should have made by now. Have you made those steps? But basically the, the consent decree is toothless because the party who is in control is not actually exercising um, their responsibilities. The final point I make about Chicago, having grown up and spent most of my life there, is that uh, the police department there is very incestuous. And you know they're all related to one another. They all grew up in the same communities, they make sure that their relatives get jobs. And it's very hard to change that culture given that kind of entrenchment. And I will say, I do believe that Lori Lightfoot is committed to doing it. It's a very, very hard piece of business and you will help her by putting pressure on her because then that allows her to go back to the police chief and say, not good enough, not good enough. But you're asking them to break habits that are generations old, that have been passed down from father to son to grandson. And, and that's a societal problem, not just a law enforcement problem. Definitely. So we have a few audience questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot to those for a second and then go back to the, the ones that we talked about beforehand. Um, so the first question is that you mentioned interacting with corporations to try and influence reform through that lens. Um, so could you give any examples of meaningful ideas that have arisen so far with respect to that and how, how those corporate decisions might impact change, you know, more generally? Yeah, so the first thing I advise CEOs to do is if you think you have an inclusive uh, culture in your workplace, do a reality check. Talk to the black and brown people who work there 
and ask them, what is their experience? And CEOs all across this country have been stunned by the response that they've gotten. Now, I, I will say this, that I think uh, myself included, when I was in the corporate community, you learn to swallow a lot of stuff just to get by. You don't want to look like you have a thin skin. You want to see, feel like you can take a joke. And that applies to both racism and sexism. And I think part of the liberation of this past summer is that people are going, oh, you want to ask me what I think? Well, I'm going to tell you what I think now. And I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. And this happened under the Obama administration soon after, um, so many, I think it was Michael Brown's death. One of my colleagues who's white came into my office and said, closed the door and said, what is this talk that people are talking about that happens in the black community? I said, oh, well, every black parent, set of black parents, sit down their children, uh, their boys historically, now they're girls, and they explain to them that when they interact with the police, they have to behave differently. And put your hands on the steering wheel, 10 and two o'clock, don't talk back, be compliant, don't move without asking permission to move. You, many of you know the drill. And if your white friends are in the car with you and they're smarting off and talking back to the police, mm -mm, you don't get to do that. And I don't care if you're 16 or you're 52, you don't have that same permission structure. And he said to me, good question, how come I didn't know that? And I realized because black people don't talk about the talk or they didn't. Now we're talking about the talk. And I think that that's healthy in order for people to have some empathy. I will listen to um, Joe Biden talk about his conversa conversation with uh, George Floyd's family uh, a month or so ago, a couple months ago now. And he said, and it's important for a white man to say this. He said, just imagine what it feels like to be terrified every time your children go out. He was saying this after the conversation with the Floyds. Is he just imagine how that is? You're terrified as a parent all the time. We need white allies, and who better than the president of the United States, to talk about our experience. Because what happened when Barack Obama said, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon Martin? People went crazy. Well, if he had a son, he would look like Trayvon Martin. And he was trying to make it a teaching moment to say, even the president of the United States' son would be at risk walking down a street with Skittles in his own neighborhood. And that's not the police, but it's racism, right? Back to my earlier point. Um, I digress. What was the question? <laughs> I will go off on a tangent if you let me. So you can bring me back to the question. No, the tangents are great. The tangents are great. Um, so I'm going to I'm gonna pivot to a tangent also um, and go back to Chicago, which we talked about briefly before. Um, this is another audience question. Um, so about Chicago police specifically, uh, in Chicago, police officers predominantly live in a few specific areas, like the 19th and the 41st wards. Um, what kind of changes do you think are actually plausible in those communities that are very insular, have a lot of power? And like you said, you know, this all takes root in communities itself. Well, that's the point I was making earlier. They are concentrated. It is very incestuous. And I think part of what I would encourage the mayor to do and the police chief is to recruit people who live in the neighborhood to serve in those neighborhoods. That's back to the trust issue. And I did remember the question, and we'll come back to it in a second. Um, <clears throat> that gets to the trust issue. And look, if your life experience growing up in the 19th Ward, for example, has nothing to do with black people. And all you've seen are caricatures on the evening news growing up. And your life experience, you didn't have any black friends, you didn't play sports with any black people, or if you did, it was just on the court or the field, and then you went your separate way. It is natural for you to have some reservations and some hesitancy. Same thing would apply to black people who've never been around any white people or Native Americans who've been <clears throat> isolated on an Indian reservation before. We are all a part of our life experiences. And if the police are truly there to serve and protect the entire city, I think they should also reflect the diversity of the city, not just in race, but in geography. Tie them to the communities in which they grew up. Now you might say, well, it's a little conflict of interest because maybe you know, Cousin Pookie got in trouble and you know Cousin Pookie, but you know what? then you might give him a break because you do know him. You know, he's a good kid. He just is a screw up and he needs some help. And, and you can talk to his parents and say, 
this is what happened and, and try to handle it in a way that doesn't involve the permanency of the criminal justice system, which begins in the juvie system. And I think we need law enforcement that's looking for ways of solving tensions or even violence in our community without resorting. The criminal justice system should be the last resort. And I think it's the default first resort. So back to the question, which I remember, the business community. I raised the example of the talk because I think we as black people have to be more willing to talk about things that are uncomfortable and difficult for us. And the liberation I saw this summer in the boardrooms that I've been privy to is that when asked, people are opening up. And I, look, I chair the board of a not-for-profit progressive organization. And I had a town hall with my team, looks like the UN. And black people said, oh yeah, I feel some microaggressions in here sometimes. And our CEO who was white had to listen to that. And well, he should. And so I think the first step for the business community is listen and then figure out what are the structural impediments and what are the cultural impediments to equality. And I spent a lot of time on Silicon Valley when I was in the administration and still do. And they used to always say, well, I can't find qualified people. I'm like, well, do you go recruit at HBCUs? Because that's where the people are. Just like if you want to rob a bank, go to the bank because that's where the money is. And it's just like the simplest things in the world that they need help understanding how to do. And to understand that there's a huge difference between diversity and inclusion. <clears throat> you might be able to recruit somebody if you dangle enough. And I say this to you guys going into law firms as well. But if the only people you see when you go for a flyback are people who don't look a thing like you, if they weren't smart enough to figure out they should put somebody who looks like you in front of you for whom you can say, okay, this place, there are partners here who look like me. And when I say look like me, maybe it's because you're black. Maybe it's because you're gay. Maybe it's because you are from another country. Whatever it is, if you don't feel welcomed, if you don't see people who look like you, if there isn't an acknowledgement that diversity is a strength and you are a person of color, or a person who falls in one of those other categories, then you have to question whether it's the right place for you. But inclusion is about culture. And so, yes, get people in the door, but then what do you do to make them feel comfortable once they're there? And are you mentoring people? Are you making sure that everybody's getting great assignments? Are you making sure that there is um, accountability and that you're not tiptoeing around people because you don't want to offend them because of their color or something else? I mean, you've got to, be willing as a, as a company or as a law firm to ask yourself some hard questions about if you look around, like I, if I join a board and I'm the first one, you know I'm asking like, why didn't you have any black people here before? Why am I the only woman here? Why are you suddenly woke? What happened? And am I checking a box or are you really actually trying to get something done? And I think when you're in the driver's seat, interviewing and coming from UFC, you are in the driver's seat be willing to ask some hard questions up front so that you don't have to discover them once you get there. And your generation is much more likely to do that than my generation was. So I think the business community, and that's everything from the business roundtable, which are the 200 largest companies in the country who are collectively and individually checking themselves and asking these questions, but it will only be sustainable if people of color are willing to speak up and tell them hard, uncomfortable truths. And if they make you feel safe enough to do it, then that there won't be repercussions. So I'm pushing the broader agenda because I believe, unlike our president, that there is actually systemic racism in our country. And that by acknowledging it is the first step to trying to end it. Great. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, community engagement. We talked a little bit about culture changes, things like that. Um, so I'm curious what role you think civilian oversight uh, could have in police reform? It's a big question in Chicago right now, CPAC, GAPA, and all of that. So I'm wondering what role you think uh, the community should have in police reform. Well, ironically, it's what drew Lori to run for mayor in the first place, is her service as a civilian um, overseeing the police. And I think, I think it is really important to have two things. One, transparency, and two, checks and balances. And you can't expect the police to patrol themselves and you can't expect the state's attorney to do it as well. And 
one of the recommendations in our 21st Century Task Force report that was controversial, and it came from Brittany Packnett, who was one of the young demonstrators in Ferguson who worked for Teach for America, was that when there is a police brutality, we should have an independent um, prosecutor looking at the evidence because the police have to have a very close working relationship with the state's attorney. That's how they do their jobs in collaboration. And it's much harder to do that job if you're also trying to be independent and investigate them. And so I don't, I've yet to understand the downside of having an independent prosecutor. Um, and, and in addition to that, having these oversight boards where you have a public meeting and evidence is brought forth and the press is there and everybody gets to see the facts and understand the recommendations, I think that only helps the process. And let's face it, our processes are broken. People do not trust the justice system to be just. And people of color don't trust it to be just. And if that's the case, then we have a problem we have to acknowledge. And so we should be bending over backwards to figure out what are the levers we have to push to build back that trust. And I think transparency and independent oversight are two. Yeah, um, and then a related question that I have um, just about the system as a whole. Um, so obviously, you know, the system as a whole has a lot of problems, needs, needs a lot of change. Um, do you think that police reform can sort of have a, a domino effect on other aspects of the system and impact, you know, prosecutors, judges, and juries? Uh, do you think it's sort of the start of greater reform or do you think that the police um, seem to be like the root cause of the, of the inequities that we're seeing? No, as I said, I think police are a microcosm and they've already had the broader reform because the business community is asking questions. Uh, members of Congress actually almost voted on a bill. That never happens in a bipartisan way. Um, so they, so, and there are jurisdictions around the country who are making changes for um, police reform too. And I think, I think that, you know, the thought of getting shot and killed in your own home when you're asleep or watching a person die over eight minutes and 46 seconds is just so searing at a time when the other difference between this and Eric Garner was that everybody's home looking at the news 24 hours a day and seeing it loop over and over and over again. No one could avoid seeing it. And when everybody's going to work, you could easily have missed some of those other atrocious deaths. And so the focus that it received was so jarring. And I think people realize well, if that could happen and officers could stand by so callously with so many witnesses, what on earth is going on? And so it is a soul searching moment. And I think it's important, which is why I started this conversation broadening it. It's important that we not look at it as just a police problem because it can't be solved unless we look at the broader societal issues. Um, I mean, I suppose you could make an argument, I'll make it, well, we're just going to recruit police who have a background where they've grown up in a diverse community, they've been through this training program, et cetera, et cetera. But that's just, I think, scratching around the surface. I think we really have to get to the broader issues at the same time as we try to ensure that police officers are actually prepared to do what they've sworn to do. Yeah, uh, and we have an audience question in a related realm. Um, this person is wondering um, how you think mass incarceration and the war on drugs should be reformed with relation to police brutality um, and what you think can be done at the state and the city level. Well, we tried, for example, to um, reform the federal criminal justice system, not because of the impact, because there are only about a couple hundred thousand people in the federal system, but because we wanted it to be a prototype that could be adopted at the state and local level. And we started with trying to reduce mandatory minimum sentences on nonviolent drug offenders um, under the theory that we had support from law enforcement, from judges, from faith organizations, from the business community. Everybody appreciated the fact that these mandatory minimums are ridiculous. In fact, one of the more poignant letters that President Obama received was from a judge, federal judge, who had uh, been subject to a mandatory minimum requirement and sent someone to prison. And when President Obama started commuting sentences for people, 
he said in his letter that every day he would look at the list of people hoping this one person in particular was on it. And thank heavens, we did commute the guy's sentence. And he just said his hands were tied and he felt so horrible understanding the unique situation of this case that he was bound by these mandatory minimums. The reason we started with the mandatory minimum nonviolent drug offenses is that we thought we could get Republican support. And in fact, we did have strong Republican support and talk about strange bedfellows. I worked with the general counsel of Coke Industries and um, many of the conservative think tanks and everybody kind of came at it for a different, from a different perspective. But everybody realized that what, if we have 5% or 4% of the world's population, why on earth do we have 25% of the world's prisoners? It doesn't make any sense. And, but, but my responsibility for the, in the second, one of my responsibilities in the second term of the White House was not just to look at this federal legislation, but to look at criminal justice writ large. So what do we do to keep young people, particularly young boys and men of color out of the system to begin with, which might mean let's not expel and suspend our kids from schools. We had a whole conference on our suspension policies that disproportionately fall on um, people of color. What are we doing to make sure that law enforcement is behaving in a responsible way? What are we doing about these mandatory minimum sentences? What are we doing when people are incarcerated to make sure that they are getting the resources that they need and the training that they need and the drug habilitation that they need uh, and to um, be prepared when they are released and 600,000 people are released every year from our prisons to re-enter society and then are we gonna give them a job? And so one of, one of our ideas that we did was we asked employers voluntarily to just say, you know, I'll, I'll volunteer to ban the box, which as you all probably know, means that you don't look at somebody's background as to whether they've been incarcerated at the front end of the hiring process. You wait until the back end of it all. And so I think the goal of what we were doing in Washington was to say to local and state governments who house 2.2 million prisoners and probably far more than that by now, that's the data from when we were there, um, how can you implement these changes at the local level to ensure that we are breaking that school to prison pipeline that is um, so systemic, particularly and disproportionately in communities of color. And what other tools are, do we have available to you? And again, some of this gets back to social services. I've seen some incredible um, diversion programs that have been run around the country at the local level, uh, sometimes by judges who just made up their mind. I, I don't wanna see all these young people coming in my courtroom because I know they're gonna be back here as adults. Um, so yes, I think there are many steps that can happen at both the state and the local level to reform the system and make it more fair and equitable. And um, I mean, I'll give you one story. There is a, there's a judge out in um, Compton. This is a crazy story. Judge out in Camp Compton who um, was over juvenile court. And she kept looking at the files of the young girls that were, and young girls and teenage girls that were coming through her courtroom. And regardless of the crime that they were there for, they all had one thing in common. They were all victims of sexual uh, of rape. Uh, and um, most of them had been um, taken in by pimps. And there was actually a book online, How to Be a Pimp, uh, widely distributed in Compton. And she just made up her mind that she was not going to put these girls who had been raped and um, forced into prostitution into the system. And so she created on her own a diversion program where she required them to go through counseling and rehab and made sure that they had a safe place to live because so many of the girls on the street in Compton um, were running away from home. And in fact, one woman teenager said to me, you can't walk down the street two blocks in Compton if you're a teenage girl and not have somebody try to um, take you into prostitution. And that's just what one judge did. And so just imagine if we had a program nationwide available at the state and local level where we could take these victims and help them avoid the criminal justice system. So my next book will be on all, in fact, there is a really good law review article I recommend that you all read that President Obama signed and the rest of us wrote um, on the criminal justice reform efforts uh, during his administration. And they really, it's really a soup to nuts, excellent. It's Harvard Law Review. 
um, excellent summary of all of the different ways in which we could turn levers to impact at state, local, and federal uh, levels the criminal justice system. Yeah, uh, and we have 2016. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and we have a follow-up question uh, also from the audience on this. Um, this person is wondering about your views on Oregon's decriminalization of drugs um, and relatedly when you think America might be ready for hard conversations about decriminalizing sex work, thinking hard about violent crime, which is most of why prisons are so overcrowded. Um, that, just that question. <laughs> yeah, well, this is one where I think we have to take some baby steps and where I think having data from states would be helpful to federal policymakers. Um, I'm a big believer, maybe because I started in local government, I think that culture changes on the ground, not because somebody in Washington tells you it should, and I'll give you an example of that in a second. Um, so I think it's pretty much a non-starter, or a non-starter, no-brainer in most of the country that we should be decriminalizing marijuana, and obviously there have been many states who have done that. I think once we have the data on the fact that crime has not gone up in the states where that has been the case, where opiate addiction has not gone up, where whatever data points we think are germane to make the public policy argument that it should happen, then that enables us to look at taking the next step. I think we do need far more diversionary programs and not just for nonviolent crimes, but we, we should have the discretion to look behind the story of the individual to find out what led to that crime in the first place. And having that happen in programs such as the one I described to you from Compton around the country would be helpful. And I, and I part of my um, strong belief in this is if you look at um, same-sex marriage, when President Obama took office, same-sex marriage was legal in two states. By the time the Supreme Court ruled in 2015, it had grown to 37 states and the District of Columbia. And the question I put to the law students, you law students, would be, would the Supreme Court have reached the same conclusion had the case um, come before the Supreme Court in 2007? I'm not sure that it would have. And so there is this correlation between the Constitution and the courts and culture. And it was a lot easier for them to reach the right, in my opinion, constitutional conclusion, given the work that had been going on in the states leading up to that point. And that's where culture comes in here. And I think we can't think of the law in isolation because they're human and they are affected. Otherwise, you wouldn't see reversals of Dred Scott and Plessy versus Ferguson and God forbid Roe versus Wade. Culture matters and it impacts the law in dramatic ways. And so I also believe that doing that work at the state and local level helps build the data set that you want, the evidence that you need. I mean, one of the data points that I remember Eric Holder used to say all the time is that at the same time as we had reduced the number of people we were incarcerating in federal prisons, crime also went down for the first time since the data had been collecting. Crime went down and we reduced the number of people incarcerated. That helps make the argument to take the policy in a broader way or to go deeper, but that we tend to be incremental with change in this country. And when we try to do big things like the Affordable Care Act, people rebel, even if it's good for them. So that's my two cents. Uh, and that's a great segue to the last question I'm gonna ask and then we'll open it up to, to more audience questions. Um, I do wanna talk about the big question of abolition versus reform. Uh, so some abolitionists have said that police reform just can't work because the entire institution is, is sort of rotten at the core. Um, so I'm just curious whether you think reforms can work, whether we should go to abolition, uh, whether you think abolition is a viable solution and we could get to a point where uh, we focus on restorative justice and things like that instead of punishment. Well, I think restorative justice should be a big part of our reform effort. And so I think one of the things I'm worried about is semantics and the language that we use. When you say, you know, abolish the police department, well then let's say tomorrow, Lori says, I've had it, no more police. What's gonna happen when somebody commits a crime and or in the midst of committing a crime and you wanna call 911? Well, I know when people say, abolish, they don't mean make it go away completely probably, but when you use that word, 
It's a dog whistle to people who don't want to see any change at all. And so I always say, be careful about the language that you use. It's why it's one of the reasons why the word dreamers works so well for the people who were born were not born in this country, are young and were brought here by their parents. And why words like illegal alien are just horrendous. Language matters. It is so much easier to sell people on dreamers than it is to say, you know, illegal aliens. And so that's why you're beginning to see people be more conscious about the language that they use and you have to look at it through, you're not trying to convince the people who are already there with you. You're trying to convince the other people who are looking for a reason not to want to change. So I think words matter. I think restorative justice or reimagining policing more accurately reflect where I fall on this needle. So I think that part of society as we know it is having checks and balances. Because if you get rid of the police, well, you're also gonna get rid of the judiciary. Well, they have biases, implicit, explicit. Judges are racist, just like everybody else. So it's a slippery slope argument, I guess, that I'm making. And so I would rather say, let's put some checks and balances in place with, that support the policy of prohibiting discrimination. I can't tell a police officer not to be racist. I can tell him he'll be fired if he behaves in a way that is discriminatory. And that's what government is there to do. It is not to tell you what to believe in your heart, it's to tell you what the rules are in our, in our civilized society. That's part of what a democracy is all about, playing by those rules. Um, but part of the rules I think also have to be one size does not fit all. And that restorative justice in the long run could be much more helpful to society than are incarcerating somebody. And so then the question is who makes that decision? And that's the conversation I'd be interested in having. Like how, and, and I would also recommend, um, my best friend from law school is Carol Mason. She's president of John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. And she had, I think it was like a six part series on reimagining police. And she had stakeholders on all ends of the spectrum on this one issue in particular and a much broader topics as well. I would suggest you guys look at it because it was a very thoughtful analysis about what do we really mean? And you might find just as in the conversation about the criminalization, decriminalization of drugs, that some jurisdictions decide they want to go much further than others. And I think it, it should be a conversation with the residents. Um, some of your fellow students were out protesting in front of the provost home in Chicago um, about two months ago. And uh, I live across the street from the provost. And I thought the provost um, should have gone out and talked to them. I always go out and talk to people. I've had a lot of people protest in front of my home and in front of my office and wherever I am. And I always take the opportunity to go and talk to them. But the, I think the argument, and if anybody here knows more about it than I do, feel free to, to inform me. I just read the literature that they slipped under my door. Um, but the basic argument was to get rid of the campus police. Well, you know what? I've had my home broken into and the campus police actually show up faster than the Chicago police do. And so the question I have had was, well, why? What is it that they're not doing? So rather than just saying we don't want them, what is it that you think the social contract should be with the campus police? Because actually when I was commissioner of planning and development, the communities in Woodlawn and North Kenwood, Oakland wanted the campus police, the homeowners who lived in those neighborhoods wanted us to expand the boundaries of their coverage so that they could have a supplement to the Chicago police because the Chicago police were not paying enough attention to the broader community because they knew the campus police was in there protecting Hyde Park, South Kenwood. So I think it's, it's a fair question that shouldn't be decided in a vacuum and it shouldn't be decided by just one group of stakeholders. It should be decided by the people who actually live in the community. Um, and then the, and the full appreciation of the consequences of those decisions should be absorbed. And then I think we should experiment and see what might work and build some evidence to make a case for it and then take it to a larger uh, jurisdiction. Great. Uh, so we're going to open it up to audience questions now. I mean, we've had some audience questions already, but we're going to open it up to more direct audience questions now. Um, so if you would like to ask uh, Ms. Jarrett a question, feel free to raise your blue hands and I'll just go down the list as I see him. Um, and, and if anybody would like to push back on anything that I said, 
in, in lieu of a question, I welcome your feedback. Uh, and while we're waiting for, for the little blue hand soup here, I do have one more audience question that I didn't get to earlier. Yes. Um, so this question is about, uh, there's a Michigan state study that indicates that uh, black police officers actually shoot black people at higher rates than even white officers do, possibly because they uh, come into more frequent contact with black people in their own communities. Um, so they're wondering whether you think replacing officers from the outside neighborhoods with officers from the same neighborhood would actually help solve the police violence issue. Well, well, black officers, just because you're black doesn't mean you're not a racist, right? Um, and I mean a racist towards other black people. That There is some of that. I still think if you are black and you're policing a neighborhood in which you grew up, the level of familiarity tilts in the positive. I'm not saying that there aren't some negatives, but I think it tilts in the positive. Uh, I don't see any audience questions right now, but I'll give folks a minute. Come on, you guys. You don't look shy. I have so many in the chat. I know you all have, have thoughts. <laughs> uh, EJ, go for it. Oh, EJ, your okay. microphone's having trouble. Okay, hold on. Try again. Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Uh, sorry about. That. Thank you for coming to speak, Mister. Um, you know, on that point of restorative justice and like having hard conversations, um, and America kind of being incrementalist. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts would be on trying to move America towards that path. Um, you know, let's say we do have a Biden administration, um, and we will, we will have a Biden. Administration. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, and, you know, he tries to put out some like national mandates trying to, um, you know, maybe target, I guess, like, to put it bluntly, like white affluent neighborhoods where the police aren't really a presence already. Um, and try implementing these sort of restorative justice practices, because uh, it seems that the biggest opposition to these type of programs is uh, people don't feel like they'll still be, quote unquote, safe. Uh, without the guns in the community, mm -hmm. even if they don't see the guns in the community all the time. Uh, they're just imagined. Um, so I, I, I'm just really curious how you think, you know, America can move towards that way of adjudication. Well, I think it wouldn't get to the issue of people being afraid of Black people. I mean, that's the problem. They, they're afraid of restorative justice in a Black community. They're not afraid of it in a white community. And so I don't know that they're transferable. Like if it really, really works well in the white suburbs, I don't think you'll get those white suburban people to say, therefore we should do it in the black community. Um, but I'll tell you what was a teaching moment, I thought. And, and we need, I mean, so after um, Reverend Pinckney and the eight parishioners were murdered uh, in Charleston, you guys may remember that uh, several of the families showed up in court when the young man who will remain nameless, I never name the murderers because I think they like the notoriety. Um, and the family said, we forgive you. And President Obama gave the eulogy down in Charleston and he, everybody remembers that he sang, but he sang Amazing Grace because of what that song means. And it is such amazing grace to find it in your heart to forgive somebody who had murdered your loved one. But forgiving them, and, and, and I think we have to be willing to like look at this in the extreme. I respect that they forgave him. I don't want that young man out on the street. So how does restorative justice work in that kind of a setting? I would open that up to you guys. Give me an example using an extreme of where you think society would accept or under what circumstances do you think other than the example you just gave of a white suburban area but a more realistic community how does it actually work in your in your ideal anybody I like I'm a law professor except i won't call on you because i was traumatized when i used to get called on Anybody? Uh, EJ, I think your mic is still. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Could oh. I respond to that with like yeah. a, of course not you like can. a real word? 
like a real world hypothetical. Um, I think um, a really telling example is um, after the, I'm forgetting his name, the, the young white man that shot up the black church. Uh, yes, and, we're trying not to use his name, yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, the church came together and forgave him. Well, that's what I just said. Yeah, but like, I think there's tons of, there's tons of examples of that, but like. They forgave him, but they didn't want him released from prison. I mean, I think, they did. okay, so <laughs> if you're asking for my hypothetical, like the harder question is that we think prison is a, is a, is a solution. We just like, it's an easy way to the solution. We like hiding away people so we don't see that our most downtrodden are there. Um, yes, I agree with you. But, but that's why I gave the extreme example where even these folks who forgave him, which would have been really hard for me to do, they didn't want him released from prison because they thought he was a threat to society. A very dangerous person who was a threat to society. And the question I have, which is why I kind of like, I would go a little further than your hypothetical of the white suburb to try to test this out. But I think it is also a slippery slope. And at what point do you say, or do you say, restorative justice isn't enough? There are people who should not be walking on the streets because there's nothing we can do to make them safe and not a threat to others. So I'm just curious as to like in your thought process and any of you, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, like where do you say, okay, maybe that's a bridge too far or do you? Do you think everybody can be helped and, and can be a part of society? You do? Uh, personally, yeah I, yeah, I do. This is like kind of my own like, religious background I do believe that there's like everyone is redeemable I think that's like a big point of the criminal laws like we want to give everyone their chance uh, and like personally like to go down like your hypothetical in the reverse I think also requires that uh and like for like the end of this hypothetical is like I disagree with the death penalty um I do too. if if, if you agree but it, like if you agree that the death penalty is valid and that there are some people who are so dangerous that you can kill them. The state can legally kill them. It's very like it's very hard not to see what else the state could justify. Uh, for instance, we could justify under a Trump presidency, hypothetically, testing people with vaccines for COVID without knowing their efficacy. That's a, a valid exercise of the police power. That's Jacobson versus Massachusetts. Um, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. And that, that, that's like the same implication. And that's why also I disagree. You can't have the death penalty, but if, if we're going to take off the extremes on both sides, I think it should be valid. And I think this is a one sided ballot where we're much more punitive than like restorative. Well, but, but so maybe, I mean, to me, if we're talking hypotheticals and ideals, what I would prefer is um, a more moderate solution, which is to say, you have breached your social contract with society by murdering nine people. You have to prove to society that you are ready and prepared to be a lawful member of society. I don't think our prisons do that. I don't think they are deterrents. I don't, they, they're punitive, but to what end? They don't make you better by punishing you. So I agree with you wholeheartedly that our current criminal system just makes people worse. But isn't then the question, how do we put people through, to use your word, restorative justice, where they're not wandering around in society until they're fully restored? How do you do that? Isn't that the better question? Rather than just, I mean, because how does restorative justice work in your mind? Just, let's just play out the guy who killed the nine people in the church. What should happen next? Well, I think there's two things. I think, I mean, I think one question is you like assuming that society didn't create this condition in the first place. Um, I'm not sure about that assumption. Oh, um, of course it did. It absolutely did. A 21 year old doesn't become a white supremacist without society. Sure, it contributed mightily, no doubt. 
But I, I mean, like this example is telling like a lot of white supremacy is built on like just failing life conditions. I feel like to integrate someone in society means giving them, giving them hope, giving them a chance and not some sort of hatred or ideology that gives yeah, them life purpose. Know, I, I completely agree, but you know what? White supremacists don't wanna be in a society where I exist by definition. They don't want to be in the United States with the way it looks today, where it is browning by the day. They, they really don't, they want us to go away. And so how do you coexist in a society with white supremacists who act on their white supremacy? It's one thing to say, okay, you're a white supremacist, you can go demonstrate, you can go march, but you actually can't kill nine people in a church. So how do you bring them back in when they are unwilling? So uh, we are running low on time and we have okay. more audience questions. So. A long time on this one, but it was good. <laughs> A great, great conversation. I'm glad, glad we could have yeah. a little bit. Last um, question, anyone else? Uh, yeah, we have a few more in the audience, so we're going to try and get through as many as you can before okay. uh, before you have to go. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to you, Gona. Hi, uh, Ms. Sheridan. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, it was a very interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, okay, very much. Um, so my question has to do with um, violent crime writ large. So last week, Chicago just crossed the threshold for 700 murders within the city. And by all indications, it seems like next year will be within 600 to 700 and the year after it will be the same. And we know from CDC data that the number one source of death amongst young black men between 16 and 34 is homicide. Um, so my question I wanted to ask was, how do you envision a Biden administration tackling this particular trend? And how do you think law students should be thinking about the particular issue of homicide and death, especially amongst young black men, um, as we enter the workforce and, and try to address what I think is, is very likely its own kind of epidemic? Thank you. It's a good question. And one that I've given an enormous amount of thought to. Um, of all, well, there are a few few issues that we were unable to address during the Obama years that eat away at me. And reducing gun violence is one of them. And like 32,000 people die every year from gun violence. Two thirds take their own life, I might add. And in cities like Chicago, uh, the spotlight gets put on the city when there's um, a number such as the one you just mentioned, uh, or the spotlight gets put on a, you know, a white suburb like Newtown when 26 people get murdered or Pulse nightclub or I could go on and on and on. But every single day, young black men are dying on the streets of Chicago and it doesn't get the attention it deserves. And it's happening for a whole host of reasons. And I think there is not one approach, but many approaches that we have to take to solve the problem. A big piece of the problem is poverty and hopelessness and a sense that you're not gonna get a fair chance and a fair shake no matter what. And we should be creating opportunities for our young people so that they don't feel that way. Another issue is the ready access of guns. And we tried very hard to get Congress to pass a law to close the background check loopholes, but there are many other things we could do. In fact, President Obama signed 16 and then I think 22 executive orders um, trying to improve gun safety. A, a city like Chicago, it doesn't matter because you often hear conservatives say, well, Chicago has some of the strictest gun laws in the country, but look at the murder rate. Well, guess what? Indiana's right next door. But guess what? The trains go through Chicago and they drop them off by the carton loads. Uh, and it's easier to find a gun in some neighborhoods than to find a book. And that's just a simple, painful, excruciating fact. And so the question is, how are we gonna keep guns out of the hands of people who are a threat to themselves and to others? That doesn't deal with the under, right, under uh, the fundamental issue of poverty and lack of opportunity, but we also have to figure out how to get the guns out of the wrong hands. And so, so I'll give you an example. And like the NRA, well, let me just give you my example. The federal government is the largest purchaser of guns in the country. We spent a lot of money on guns. The Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, 
we then had the FBI, the Defense Department. We have buying power. And so one of the executive orders President Obama signed would require those three agencies to insist that the manufacturers develop smart guns. If you can figure out how to do a facial recognition with your phone or your thumb on your phone, well then certainly you could do the same thing with the gun because the vast majority of people who die on the streets of Chicago, black men and boys from gun violence, were not the primary legal purchaser of the gun. And so if only the person who was the primary legal purchaser of the gun could squeeze the trigger, wouldn't that help? It was such an obvious thing to do. And the NRA was totally against it. Why? Well, I promise you, Joe Biden will pick that up right away and, and try to figure out how could you provide resources at the local level to try some things to reduce gun violence. Arnie Duncan, who's a dear friend of mine, was our secretary of education in Washington, also the superintendent of public schools in Chicago, now works for um, an organization funded by Lorraine Powell's jobs that goes into the prisons and works with the people who pull the trigger. Restorative justice, but in the, in the jail system to try and then tries to give them opportunities, job opportunities, so that they could leave a, lead a law abiding life. And it's an extreme form of intervention but he's making progress. And so I think we have to try some experiments to save these young people and give them that ladder of opportunity. People don't choose gun violence as a first resort. They just don't. They choose it when they give up. And I think part of your responsibilities as leaders of tomorrow in the legal system is to try to figure out what are the levers that we can turn creatively? What are the demonstration projects that we can try to get funded to figure out how to address this issue. And let's care about the fact that these kids are dying in record numbers, but let's care about them as individuals, not in the aggregate. I, so, I went on. All right, another question real quick. I'm gonna be faster with my answers, not because they weren't good questions, but because I wanna make sure we get to them. That's okay. Um, I do have just one last question to wrap up, which I think uh, segues perfectly from what you just said, and is just what advice do you have for people like us who are, you know, young law students about to enter the legal field? Uh, what advice do you have? Oh my gosh, read my book. I mean, it really, I, I, I um, am part of the reason why I like my affiliation with the University of Chicago is it allows me to spend time with you. You're so darn smart. You're thinking about the world in ways that it would never have occurred to me at your age. You have so much information at your fingertips that wasn't available. You have uh, platforms that you can use to be a force for good, or you can weaponize them. I ask you to use them to be a force for good. And you're going to have this incredible education and um, training that will enable you to go out and make an impact in any way that you want. And my uh, paperback, I changed the subtitle to say, when the perfect plan crumbles, the adventure begins. Because I think sometimes at um, young ages, and certainly I did, when I finished um, college, I made a 10 year plan of what I was gonna do by the time I was 31. And the last thing on the plan was live happily ever after. And I did the first six things quite successfully. And the last thing uh, left me miserable instead of happy. And so I had to, my plan crumbled and I had to figure out another plan. And that's when life got really interesting. And I went to work for local government and I thought I was gonna be a partner in a law firm and that was my plan. And lo and behold, I left the fancy office and the high rise building looking out of Lake Michigan. And I walked into a cubicle at city hall and I've never looked back. And I want you to feel the freedom to swerve, to start in one place and then be willing to uh, have the courage to say, I, my voice inside of me is telling me this isn't right. And you also, because life has hopefully many chapters to it, I've spent half of my career in the public sector and half of my career in the private sector. And every job I've had going back and forth has added value to the next job I've had. And so I encourage you to make those swerves and to figure out how with the incredible education you've worked so hard to receive, you can be a force for good. And it can manifest itself in a gazillion different ways. And only you will know whether or not you're maximizing 
your potential. And you don't have to maximize it the first year out of law school. It's a, it is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And I, I love the fact that you are interested in this issue because it is one of the thornier, more complicated, devastating issues that's impacting communities across our country. And we will not be that more perfect union with the kind of inequality we are seeing in the criminal justice system writ large. And you can be a part of the solution. And I encourage you all to participate in the clinic at the law school. I visit it, I've visited it every year since we've left now. And one of the people who President Obama commuted, the commutation application was drafted by the folks in the clinic. And um, Allison Siegler allowed the, or included the law student on the phone when they received the phone call to say that their commutation had been granted. Well, those young people will never forget that experience. And he, the guy who was commuted is doing great right now. And so you have the potential to be an extraordinary force for good. And the only thing that would stop you is you. So get out of your way and go change the world. There's a lot of people like myself counting on you. I have a black, brown, um, Indian grandson. And I'm already worried about having to give him that talk. So try to figure out how you can help me make sure his life is a little less challenging than the lives of the black and brown men and women on this call have been. Thank you guys. Uh, what, a, what a great and inspiring note to end on. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining. I want to thank Valerie Jarrett for joining us today. This was a really great talk. Uh, and I'm going to pass it back to media just for some last remarks. Good luck with finals, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ms. Jarrett, for your time today. That concludes our event. I know there were still some hands up. Please feel free to continue these conversations with, e with one another. Um, I hope that these are always just a taste and a beginning of a rich discourse that is so true to who we are here at the law school. So thank you all so much for being here and have a great one. Bye-bye, everybody. Stay safe, wear a mask.